Good morning. I'm Ruth Conan, and I'm very pleased to introduce you to the 2021 Smithsonian Visionary Award recipients, David Ellsworth and Michael Horwitz. The award was begun in 2014 to honor American artists considered by experts to have risen to the pinnacle of sculptural arts and design, who have works in the permanent collections of major museums and who have demonstrated distinction, creativity, exceptional artistry, and of course, vision in their respective medium. But before we meet the artist, we are also pleased to have Mary Savig with us today. Mary is the Lloyd Herman Craft, Curator of Craft at the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Mary. Good morning. I really wanna thank you, Ruth, um, and the entire Women's Committee for your ongoing support of so many artists, really countless artists, as well as Smithsonian programs. And hearty congratulations to David Ellsworth and Michael Hurwitz. I'm sincerely honored to be here in this company. In the last several years, I personally have enjoyed an influx of publications, novels, memoirs, and studies about trees. Trees are connectors, communicators, and even mothers of entire eco ecosystems in ways we are only beginning to understand, at least in the realm of science and ecology. When the Renwick Gallery opened nearly 50 years ago in 1972, its signature exhibition intuited the deep roots of wood in our lives and culture. The exhibition Wooden Works highlighted the generative work of George Nakashima, Sam Malou, Wharton Escherich, Arthur Espinet Carpenter, and Wendell Castle. As, Lloyd, as curator Lloyd Herman noted in his preface, wood is a material familiar to everyone. It has been an essential tool of all of humanity, housing, furniture, ships, and even toothpicks and crutches, and of course, fuel. Continuing along these lines, George Nakashima reflected in the catalog that for a long time to come, and perhaps until the end of time, wood will be a material very dear to us. As recent climate change discussions and summits have warned, it seems that not only is wood dear to us, but interwoven with our own future and survival. As global leaders vow to protect forests and learn more about their health, we must all look to artists like David and Michael. These two artists are visionary because they have long communicated the complexity of wood, its vibrancy, its poetic language, its diversity in forms, with an irrepressible curiosity. The Renwick is proud to include works by both artists in its collection. David focused his attention on the details of wood that might otherwise go unnoticed, the palette, the texture, the grain, to draw out the tree's own story. And in this way, he also characterizes the tree's relationship to all that is beyond. Many of his works speak to the cosmos and even articulate the shape of the planetary orbs and interstellar voids in forms like most delight shown here. Trees and you and me, we are all made of cosmic dust and reliant on each other. To hold one of his beautiful forms can be a transformative experience. While the wood itself suggests solidity and presence, the forms are nearly weightless, a breath of air, the gift that all trees give us. And I wanna thank Jane Mason who helped let me hold one of David's works last week. Along similar lines, Michael Hurwitz, next slide please, makes furniture that plays with the properties of movement and gravity. The artist was first introduced to the power of furniture while visiting wooden works in 1972. So perhaps it is inevitable that the museum now proudly includes his rocking chairs in its collection. His forms often include virtuoso techniques and surprising materials, including papyrus, turquoise, and mica. Each artwork is a measure of his own experience as an artist. His own memories are dovetailed into the grain. This further enhances the structural buoyancy and liveliness of his work. I have long, I have longed to recline in this exemplary rocking chaise in the Renwick's collection, a sentiment surely shared by many of our visitors. Both of these artists and their distinct vanguard practices remind us of the importance of wood in our life, down to the air we breathe. Indeed, as plastic goods are currently piling up in cargo ships throughout the world, 
delaying our consumption of them, I'd like to thank these artists for reminding us that we have all we need here at hand and we cannot take it for granted. Next year, the Renwick celebrates its 50th anniversary and the Smithsonian Craft Show celebrates its 40th anniversary. In this spirit, let's all celebrate the renewed relevance and necessity of craft in American art history and culture as advanced by David and Michael. Congratulations to both artists. And now I'll turn it over to Ruth to introduce the visionary artists. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. David Ellsworth describes his primary influences as the energy and beauty of Native American ceramics, the architecture of the American Southwest and the natural beauty of the material of wood. David is considered one of the most prominent wood turners in the world but he calls himself a wooden potter because of the ceramic influence on his work. This desire to create a clay-like vessel in wood necessitated his inventing and producing his own tools. These tools enabled him to make the extremely thin walled vessels for which he is famous, some of which may be as thin as 1 16th of an inch. Next slide, please. One of the nominators said after he picked up a piece of David's work that he hadn't anticipated the perfection Ellsworth was capable of achieving in such a large complicated piece. He said it was turned so perilously thin that it was seductive beyond measure. David is an educator too and inspires future generations to take up the wood turner's trade. Few however can ever hope to rival David's elegant, very thin walled, hollow forms. I'm very happy to present David Ellsworth, our 2021 Smithsonian Visionary Award winner in Turned Wood. David. That I started out my wood turning career by starting the wood working program at the Anderson Ranch in Snowmass, Colorado in 1974. I was there for a year and then moved uh, myself and my family down to Boulder, Colorado where my first wife uh, assumed her year's leave of absence from teaching vocal music in the elementary schools in Boulder. The, uh, as you'll see in a few moments, I acquired a studio, which is actually a barn from a physicist at the university and moved my equipment in and started cranking things out. And one of the things that I learned at the Anderson Ranch from the ceramists, in fact, was that if you wanted to start a, a wood turning program or uh, make a living at what you're doing, what you needed to do was to, to develop a production item. And I said, well, what's a production item? They said, well, something that's beautiful that people can use and it doesn't cost a lot of money. So I'll be showing you some of those pieces in a moment. But what I did for the next two and a half years is to, uh, develop a salt and pepper and sugar shaker set, which oddly enough came from usable objects that one could gain in a cafe anytime. And, uh, but I want, they ended up fundamentally being laminated, but they were hollow forms nevertheless, similar to the old glass cafe sugar shakers. And uh, not in shape, but in concept. And for the next two and a half years, I worked daytimes making sugar shakers and salt and peppers. And in the evenings, I put all the production work away behind a screen and start developing the hollow turnings. And the hollow turnings came about for a number of different reasons. Here we go. Let me just wait till we, next slide. There's that wonderful barn up at 4th and Calmia in Boulder, Colorado. It's no longer there, by the way. There's some kind of a mansion in, in its place. But that was a 16 foot square room, which I divided down the middle eventually and lived in it for a couple of years and then worked in half of it and lived in the other half. And it was quite cozy, let's put it that way. Next slide. This is a, a shot of the salt and pepper and sugar shaker sets that I, that I made. The bottoms of the salt and pepper had a cork fit in it and the bottom of the, of the 
the uh, sugar shaker set or sugar shaker itself had a dovetail slide. And I made about 5,000 of these in two and a half years uh, while I was working on the, developing the hollow forms uh, at, at nighttime. So it was a complete day, oftentimes I think 18, sometimes 20 hours a day. Uh, and sh showing up at, uh, at uh, craft shows around the country. Uh, they sold, by the way, for $18 for the three pieces. Next slide, please. The primary influence uh, that Mary was talking about, and, and Ruth also, I believe, is Native American ceramics. I grew up in Colorado, and the, and the Southwest was our playground. And in particular, the, this woman's work, uh, Nampeo is her name, and she was a Sityatki Hopi and threw pots up until early 1917 or 1900s, about 1917, I think she, she stopped. But to, to look at these and imagine them being made of clay and not collapsing uh, was a tour de force of, of technique, of course, but the magnificent color patterns and, and, and uh, the pa patterns and the color template that she used was one of the things that interested me. And I translated these ideas into, into uh, wooden forms uh, with, with the bent tools that allowed me to get inside and hollow out the interior. Next slide. This is the first one that I actually succeeded successfully <laughs> in making. It's a two piece uh, element, a, red, a redwood burl at the bottom and a, a tapered slope of pow ferro at the top. And it's about seven inches in diameter. Most all of the work that I did in that early stages of, of uh, my development was in exotic materials because I couldn't sell anything in the West if it was made out of aspen or pine. So uh, I was limited in the height by virtue of the thickness of the planks I was able to make or to acquire. Um, I was limited in the height that the work could, could uh, be presented. That later changed uh, by the end of the, of the 70s with my exposure to new materials from the Northeast and the Southwest, or actually the West. Next slide, please. This is a, a leap of, uh, in, in concept to, to this, because this piece is about 13 inches in diameter. Uh, you can also see the, the positioning of the grain in here is diagonal to the profile of the form itself. And the reason for that is that I knew that that in turning green wood, it was going to change on me after I, after I turned the form out. The tensions in the material, uh, I learned how to predict the direction that they were going to go, and in some cases, even the amount that they would move. Uh, trying to keep them from cracking, obviously, is a technical feat. But uh, the point being is that by putting the grain on the diagonal, the form suddenly approaches a sense of sculpture in that you can walk around it and it changes position on you as you do that. Uh, it's quite wonderful working with Northeast Coast or woods from the Northeast simply because I could get the spalted materials primarily in maple that I couldn't get in the mountains of, of, the, of Colorado because they were so dry. They wouldn't spalt, they would just rot. Next. This is the most, probably the most extreme piece I did in spalted material because it's a punky material, decomposed cells, uh, which helps change the color of the form and create the black lines and also some of the rot that it's exposed uh, in, the, in the openings of this particular form. Quite dramatic. Uh, it, I think it exemplifies the mystery of how this is done. And, and, and one of those things that I can suggest to, to wood people and others is that when you're down inside of a form that you have the potential of blowing up, you don't go in like a bull trying to, to force the material out of there. Uh, I use the phrase, uh, have the tool go in and shake hands with the wood. And in that respect, it's a, it's a way of becoming sensitized to the different materials that I'm working with. So when I'm working with a punky material like this, it's a very light, delicate cut on the interior rather than an extreme cut that you, one might be able to make. 
with, uh, with a, a denser material. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorites. It uh, uh, was acquired from, from me by Arthur and Jane Mason and uh, become known as the, as the Mason Pot. And uh, it is in the collection of the, of the uh, uh, North Carolina Museum. And the, the combination of the spalted wood and the solid wood, uh, along with the, the opening on the upper right-hand shoulder in the foreground. Uh, and the fact that it's a sphere or started out as a sphere and then was shrunk on the sides as I, as I was shaping it. And uh, it just has a presence that has an energy to it that uh, the standard sphere just doesn't, doesn't quite have. Next slide. These are tall forms, obviously. The one on the left is about 15 inches tall, uh, again in spalted maple. This is a situation where one has to learn when to stop. And what I mean by that is that these pieces were cut directly off the gods. There was no sanding on them. It has a, it has a textured surface, almost like a sandpaper surface. And what I was trying to do in, in, in making them uh, without the classic shiny wood, wood finished surface is to show off the beauty of rawness within a form and let it just be as it is once it has been cut to these shapes and then hollowed out. Next slide, please. This on the other hand, oops, can you back there, back up to, yeah, that one right there, beautiful. Uh, this is a red oak burl, very highly polished, uh, not shiny, but uh, it, it shows the tensions within wood by deforming itself after it has been cut. And, uh, the recessed opening became a, a kind of a theme of mine after a while, which increases the drama of the interior and the mystery of how the object was made. But I love these pieces in, the, in their own right because they, I can project where they're, where they're gonna go when they start changing as the tensions dry in the fibers uh, and express this, this energy of the surface, but I don't know how much they're gonna change. And sometimes they just simply fall over because they, they have no presence to be able to stand up. Next slide, please. And this is one of the more dramatic pieces by size, at least it's 19 to 20 inches tall out of the crotch of, a, of an ash tree that grew on our property in Pennsylvania. And it gave me an opportunity to express the grain, the drama, of, <clears throat> the drama between the spring grain and the winter grain by burning it and etching out the softer summer grain, <clears throat> excuse me, and then sanding back through the char to pick up the color of the real wood underneath it, the lighter areas almost like a transparent glaze could be developed in, in ceramic. But in this case, it's, it's the only wood that I, species-wise, that I've been able to find that I could do it in, in, in wood. And uh, that's the reason I use ash. Next slide, please. This is another one. This is coming from the Black Pot Dawn, D-A-W-N series, where I'm looking basically at the atmosphere around surrounding the earth at the period of the early morning dawn and seeing the translucency uh, uh, of, of the atmosphere coming through uh, the, the clouds and uh, into the atmosphere uh, to give it really a, 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 a magnificent transition form from the darkened to the light. Next slide. And this is an influence of Takicho Takeitsu who, uh, Toshiko Takeitsu, excuse me, where uh, she left, uh, uh, she had a simple form with a very tiny opening at the top. This one's about 14 inches high and left the cracks that occurred during the drying of the clay as I did here. Uh, otherwise I would have put patches in there or little uh, butterfly ties to tie it together to draw attention to the cracks. But in this case, I just love the way they were. Uh, and this was also acquired by, by Arthur and Jane Mason and went to the Renwick Gallery. Next slide, please. 
And then I got to taking the blackened forms and decided to work into a, 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 an idea of trying to do something that I knew nothing about, and that was represent the cosmos. And I discovered a photograph of a Japanese photographer in Hawaii who filmed a complete uh, uh, transition of, of, uh, of the setting of the moon. Uh, and it, it went from a little tiny uh, eclipse of the moon. It went from a little tiny point at one point all the way up through the center hole and then down to the other end of it. It was a beautiful photo photograph. And I used that as a theme in these pieces because I knew nothing about the cosmos. And I wanted to explore things that I knew nothing about and see what I could come up with. So I started using paint along with fire and the fire changed the nature of the paint along the edges. And it just became a, a wonderful way of uh, very, very quickly, once the form has been turned, very quickly uh, taking a sponge and drawing on the form with the color. And then I made uh, brushes out of dog's hair, uh, long uh, dog's hair, which I also learned from the potters, in fact, at the ranch, uh, in order to, not on this particular piece, but in order to express just different types of line, line being the most important factor in this form. Not only line is the form, but line is the grain pattern, line is the color, line is the, as the holes, it all blends together into one. Next slide, please. Here again, you can see a, a much more dramatic approach to that by exposing the interior of the form. It's not a hollow form, obviously, but uh, one of them started out as a hollow form and I, and I went through the middle of it and uh, came up with an open form. I said, my goodness, that's a really a beautiful piece uh, just in itself. So I started to explore that. And here again, you can see the swath of the, of the color with the sponge intersecting the line of the, of the, the holes and the, the drama of the slightly tinted interior uh, of, in orange compared to the green and the black. Next slide, please. And this was the largest of the pieces from the Solstice series, where you can really see the, drama, the drama of, of how dramatic it is when, when you just allow wood to be wood and let the, the back, if you look in the very center and the bottom, you can see how the back edge of the piece is migrated through the center and up to the foreground of the piece, just through the natural tensions of the wood. It had to be cut first in order to allow the tensions to express themselves and the forms to move and become something uh, other than uh, a piece similar to the previous one, uh, where it's, it's lost its original shape and picked up its own shape. But um, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. And that's in the collection of the Philadelphia Art Museum. Next slide, please. And then at some point in the late 80s, uh, prior to the, or just slightly prior to the recession that we had, I had brought in a three and a half ton piece of redwood burl. And was this was the largest piece that I was able to make out of that huge burl. It was in the shape of a loaf of red. And I, I used the area in the lower region where the roots were and were rotted out and broken apart to become the foot of this form. And this was one of the premier pieces in this in the series called Man in the Forest Architecture. And uh, for obvious reasons, uh, it's 54 inches tall and really allowed me to explore scale of my work, which I had not been able to do uh, prior to this. I'd gone to 37 inches, but 54 was a real a, a mind bender in effect. And um, I also got another piece out of the middle of this one after this one was removed from the lathe. But the scale of it brought me into, uh, next slide please, brought me into these pieces here where uh, after a period of time, I was uh, beginning to show my age at 70, 71 or so, and realizing that I wasn't gonna be able to continue physically to be able to manage those larger deep pieces with the tools that I was working with. And I didn't want to go to stabilized tools uh, because I wanted to really 
show the interaction of the process and the value of the process to the finished object. So I came up with this idea similar to the old Cub Scout cup that you stretch out uh, from two or three pieces, but this one's got plenty of pieces in it. Starting out with a burl and cutting it and cutting it and cutting it, and then assembling it from the top down where I can pick up the movement of the form. So I'm able to gain back into scale. Um, now at 77 years old and, uh, and work with and create very, very large forms uh, when I have the right materials to work with. This is also in the Philadelphia Art Museum. I believe that's the last slide. Check yes, me if I'm thank wrong. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate, by the way, the amount of work that other people went to give Michael and me this, this very distinguished award, it, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful honor and a great privilege to, to share the stage with so many of my colleagues from the past. Uh, and uh, just want to express my, my thanks and, and appreciation for that. Thank you, David. And um, I just want to uh, let everyone know that uh, we are hoping to have some of Michael, some of Michael and David's work on display at the Smithsonian Craft Show in April. Michael Hurwitz has been in the forefront of studio furniture for over 40 years. His furniture has been described as poetic, lyrical, elegant, sinuous, and fit for royalty. Michael was inspired to become a furniture maker after he saw the inaugural exhibition at the Renwick Gallery in 1972 of the work of five prominent furniture makers at the time. Mary referred to this as well. And one of those makers was Wendell Castle, a very first Visionary Award recipient. So for Michael, it's a happy irony that things have come full circle. Michael points to a three-year residency in the Dominican Republic and two six-month residencies in Japan as important experiences in his development. In Japan, his studies generated in him an aesthetic of seemingly simple beauty in a piece created by a careful and subtle arrangement of materials to create harmony. His exceptional craftsmanship is why one nominator said, that no movement has had more than a handful of people who create its definition and cast the direction for others. Without hesitation, Michael Hurwitz is one of those individuals. Recently, Michael collaborated with the notable sculptor Martin Purrier to create seating for the Glenstone Museum. Purrier called it a deeply satisfying experience, adding that the project owed its success to Michael's knowledge and his high standards. I'm happy to present Michael Horowitz, the 2021 visionary, Smithsonian visionary in studio wood furniture. Michael. Thank you, Ruth. Um, it's, well, I'd also like to thank the Smithsonian Institution um, and the Women's Committee for um, this incredible honor. Also the, the panelists that threw David and my name into the hat. Um, it's again, a, a, an honor. I'm going to uh, organize these images in terms of uh, sources of inspiration that have been uh, uh, dr driving forces for my career. And I'll begin with materials. Can I have the next slide, please? Here I'm holding some mica that, you know, generally the projects um, are centered around wood, but they often include other materials. Um, finding beautiful materials is never um, a problem. The, the problem becomes pairing them sensitively in a way that brings out the, you know, the best character of, of both, um, both materials. And also learning enough about the materials that you don't ask them to do something that they don't wanna do. Next, please. These, um, these next few slides are of a day at the sawmill in Japan about 25 years ago. Um, I'll, I'll go through these quickly. Next slide, please. Next slide. 
this was our little um, cottage at the edge of town and the, the bounty from that day in the sawmill, air drying. And again, now all that wood is in my studio. I'm just starting to use it now. Next, please. I'm drawing on the end of a log, a crotch log, um, to give instruction to the sawyer how I want that sawn in order to maximize the, uh, the grain pattern of that, of that log. Next, please. So this is a, an example of um, a material-driven project. It's Zel I, I had gotten these three boards of Zelkova, which were this triangular shape, which I found very intimidating. I, um, I didn't know what to do with them. I didn't want to cut them into smaller pieces. I didn't know how to use them as whole pieces. So just I left them sit, sitting around the shop for years before an idea started to develop. Next, please. Um, this is the companion piece that was made at the same time uh, with that with the third board of Zelkova. The hardware is made from um, hardware is made from Damascus steel, which is actually a, a sandwich of steel and iron. And I like that that uh, that resembles the same structure that wood does. Next, please. This is a pair of desks. The desk is identical except for the materials. And um, next slide, please. The material of the desk on the left, it's curly cherry with a uh, marble mosaic. And on the right, it's um, straight grain pair, uh, quarter sawn Douglas fir with yellow pine rosettes on the right. And they both have a very different tactile sensation when you're using the desk. You know, the, the marble is cool to the touch and the wood is more like room temperature. Next, please. An oval cabinet with mica doors in the, the upper portion of it. Next, please. One of the things that I like about mica, uh, well, it was fascinating, you know, as a kid, it was fascinating to sort of peel it apart, to have a book of it and um, and uh, so uh, it's another material that I had in the studio for years before coming up with the, the use for it. That I like the way it transmits light, obviously, the way it reflects light and the way it bends. It'll, it'll bend like paper in a two-dimensional curve. Next, please. Next section is structure as design. It's a little harder to pinpoint the, uh, what I mean by that, but for me, it began as an assignment in our freshman assignment at Boston University under Jerry Osgood was to build a chair that was no more than 6% above the breaking point. So this led to ruminations about um, how engineering in its most intuitive sense could um, help define or give direction to the overall design. Next, please. Oh, I'm sorry, that's Jerry at that time, around 1975. Next slide, please. That was my response to Jerry's assignment. Um, Jerry is also a, a big proponent of using strip lamination to, to develop a curved member. And the idea being that that, that will give you a stronger member than one just sawn from a, a a board, everything else being equal, that it's the same dimension. Next slide, please. So you'll see a lot of lamination um, process in my work. On the left is a plant stand that's made from branches, which the branches have an enviable organic logic to it. You really can't improve on that system. If you were to make that form, that's the best, uh, the best way. Since we can't do that, we laminate. Next slide, please. A leather seat on the left and slatted on the right. Next slide, please. 
these almost every piece on this was laminated even the long straight long runs include a straight square steel pipe to make that so i could get a, a thin line there in that horizontal piece next please i've I don't know if I have said it already or alluded to it, but the strength to weight ratio is um, kind of um, a directive that um, that drives a lot of the work that with the ideal being very strong and very lightweight. So typically I, you know, I use as little wood as as possible to allow the that that still allows the piece to function well. Next, please. When I was teaching at University of the Arts between 85 and 89, I, uh, I rephrased Jerry's assignment for my students and I asked them to make, a, um, to make a table from no more than six board feet of lumber, which is a small board, to make it the largest table they can that would support their own weight. So that's how this giant model ended up on top of my table. Next, please. In this piece, the um, the sense of ascension with the Dominican, the diminishing progression of the shelves on the right was, you know, part of the I wanted this uplifting feeling. The challenge was how that diminishing progression would interact with the steady rhythm of the overlapping ovals and where the shelves would intersect those ovals. Um, I was happy with it, but it was a struggle to, to come to that resolution. Next, please. A much more recent piece and one that I hope to bring to Washington in April. This is a lantern cabinet. One of the things I think about when I'm developing an idea for furniture is that um, it's, its sense of autonomy, its uh, relationship to gravity, relationship to the floor. Ultimately, it's how you approach it as, a, as another body in the room. Um, if I can't make it as light as I want, I'll try to make it appear lighter. And um, so this is the lantern cabinet in yellow heart. Next, please. Next, sec next section, these slides were taken in the Dominican Republic in 1985. I was, did a three month residency. Next slide, please. And um, that's way up in the mountains kind of before tourism had leaked um, so far from the shore. Next, please. Next, please. This is my studio on the right, which is about maybe 10 feet square, maybe 12 feet square. And the major piece that I made while I was there, this uh, alluded to or included uh, references to the flora and fauna, tales of um, shipwrecks and piracy, our physical position on the precipice of a cliff overlooking a river that was about maybe two miles from the where it met the ocean. Chest on Trees <clears throat> is the title. And it was in this piece that I realized that the, that the work could be as much a repository of, um, or a record of an experience or collection of experiences as it was a piece of furniture. So that opened some doors moving forward. At, um, it helped shape my thinking. Next, please. This is the Kiyomizu Dera Temple in Japan, which is, it's been standing for about 1200 years. The columns that hold up the roof have been polished by millions of people's hands, which accentuated the grain. And um, it's about 45 feet, that deck is about 45 feet off the ground. Next, please. That's looking up at the deck from the forest floor. Next, please. And the piece that I made in uh, in response to that experience, curly hickory that I 
either sandblasted or wire brushed the grain to accentuate it and then put a black paste filler in it. Next, please. These three cabinets, I didn't, I didn't make them as a trio. In fact, they were made over a period of a few different years where I kept trying to get at something that was a little elusive. Um, and that had to do with buoyancy and balance and resilience. The piece on the left is a, a sake cabinet with two poems, a poem by a Japanese poet on the outside. And then on the inside of the door is a, uh, a, a more contemporary poet's reaction to that older poem, much like call and response in, in music where um, in the middle is a fountain with a cabinet sitting on top of a spire of water that had some engineering issues. The piece on the right is a rocking safe, which is, I don't know if you can see me, but it's like a giant sippy cup um, it, once you set it in motion, it, sit, it becomes self-writing because of a giant bronze ballast at the base. <coughs> Next, please. The next and final section is um, joint projects. These, some of them could be considered collaborations of joint projects is maybe more accurate. I tend to think of the word collaboration for me conjures images of uh, equal measure of involvement for the conceptualization and design of a piece. In most of these, I, I asked an excellent craftsman to help me arrive at a vision. This first one, Todd No made the metal vase which is completely perforated by, uh, by means of an acid bath. This is entitled Wormy Vase, and it's about the life cycle. Um, and that life cycle includes cycling through death and decay. Next, please. On the left, these ceramic demitas were made by Ann Smith, an old college friend. And on the right, was a project together with Kozo uh, Takeda in Aomori, Japan. I had this idea that I, I wanted these precious cups to be protected as if they were in a nest that um, occurred naturally. Or, and um, so Kozo helped me with that project. Next, please. I'm sorry, this is where the idea for that shelf in nest came from the tradition of Japanese um, eccentric weave baskets on the left and the truly eccentric weave of the weaver birds, of Southeast Asia. Next, please. This was a, uh, a project together with Yuji Kubo. Kubo-san is a lacquer master in also in Aomori, Japan. This <coughs> pattern in the middle of the desk is made in part by dropping pine needles in the wet lacquer surface. Next, please. There's the original um, inspiration for that pattern. It's a, it's a very old pattern that um, Kubo-san had to learn as a, as a young apprentice. <coughs> Sorry, next, please. Um, inspiration for the actual, the form of the desk came from these ink stones that um, are typically a, a rough stone that has a polished depression in it where the ink is manipulated along with water to create a usable ink. And I like the idea that that act of preparing the ink becomes a meditative act that helps um, prepare your mind and senses for the next activity. Next, please. So just examples of the calligraphist's art. Next, please. Next, please. And um, the, these, the final few slides, these were a project together with Martin Purrier. About 10 or 12 years ago, he called and asked if I would help make furniture for the Glenstone Foundation in, um, 
in Potomac, Maryland. And this was the major piece that we made while we, you know, for that project. 18 foot long bench, the base is of hickory and the seat is of maple. <coughs> Next, please. Another 18 foot long bench, this one for their deck overlooking the, their pond, their cement pond as the Beverly Hillbillies might have called it. It's my assistant Zach DeLuca on the left. Next please. Here's Martin testing a sample seat that we, we arranged a couple of different heights and angles and we'd have him come down and test and see if it met his approval. On the right is just a picture of how that laminated curve is, is made by squeezing it between two forms. Next, please. On the left, we're laminating a six foot section of the seat. So we had to make six, I'm, I'm sorry, three six foot lengths to get at, to, to develop the 18 foot length. And on the right, I'm ripping it to width. Next, please. While we were making it, I, I kept thinking how, where the two forms met, that line that was created where those two different forms met was for me a very exciting moment. And um, I thought it would be nice to make a residential scale chair that had some of that same language and, um, but on a, you know, on a smaller domestic scale. Next please. So I, um, asked Martin if that was okay with him and he gave me his blessing to move forward. Um, this, this version is an tapered oval covered in wenge with uh, purple heart pinstripes. Next please. And there's the bench doing what it does best. That's what it's built for. Now I'll hand the microphone back to Ruth. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. I think everybody can see now why we've been told your furniture is fit for royalty. It is really so beautiful. And I hope everyone has been to um, Glenstone to see those beautiful benches. And is there another bench inside also, Michael? Or is it just the two? There are a total of 13 benches, three designs. So one of them was okay. like an addition. Well, that must have been very exciting to work on that. It was amazing. So as you can see, um, both David Ellsworth and, and Michael Horwitz are such accomplished and amazing artists. And they both speak of their materials in poetic terms with great respect for the wood with which they work and ultimately the trees from which it came. David says that even turning a simple bowl, one should release the head and engage the heart. And Michael says he thinks of the furniture he creates as a portrait, in some respect, an homage to the time and place from which it came. Both artists have work in the permanent collections of many museums, including the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and our own Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Stephanie Stebich, the director of American Art, has called the Smithsonian Visionary Award a national honor. We could not have found two more worthy candidates to receive this award. We are very proud to include you both in such a highly regarded group of artists who have preceded you. Congratulations. David, if you could please explain how you hollow out your pieces. The holes are very small, it's very complicated. A little bit at a time, obviously. <laughs> Excavating the interior is a rhythm that involves two primary tools, a straight tool and an angled tool. And I go in with a straight tool to create a slight depression on the interior and then blow the dust out. And then I come in with the bent tool and, and open that cavity up and just repeat the process throughout the, the uh, entire sequence of cuts until I get to the very bottom of the interior. The one thing that I said to myself when I first started doing this is I wanted to make sure that the last cut that I made inside 
was as skillfully done as the first cut that I made inside. So that it wasn't just a novelty, but there was a, a thought process going through the entire sequence until I was completed with it. Thank you. Michael, when you make a form to shape wood, what is that made of? Um, just construction grade sheet goods, like plywood, MDF. It's a good time to use up small scraps of that stuff if I have it around. Uh, so anything cheap that, and stable and strong okay. enough. Okay. David, can you explain the spalding term? Yeah, spalding refers to the decomposition of cells within the, the fibers of the wood itself as a result of one or more uh, of 20 to 22 uh, microbes that, that covers the face of the earth. And when a tree dies uh, for one reason or another, uh, those microbes go in and attack the cells and decompose the fibers. And when they do that, they leave a tracing of what we call zone lines, the black lines that you see in spalted wood. And it's those black lines that become my key uh, as a designer to be able to, uh, which would influence scale and grain direction within the form. Uh, it's just very exciting material to work with because it has its own passion and its own references uh, to line and, and, and shape and, and the shape that I can give it. Uh, so it's, and it's a great challenge to work uh, with material that's trying to become part of the forest floor before I interrupt it. Thank you. Michael, you've stressed the importance of cutting the wood in the mill. Do you have a personal Sawyer? No, I don't. Um, it's hard living in the city, which I do, to develop those kinds of relationships. Um, I, okay. I wish I did. Uh, and I think I would make very different work if I lived in the country and had easy access to a Sawyer. Um, okay. So that was because we were in the country in Japan and we had a community that could enable us that way. Great. Okay, this one is for either of you to answer or both. Can, can you describe your tools? Did you have to create some of these tools to work with this or? I think David should speak there because he actually did, you know, the mm -hmm. world first to do what he did with tools that he created for his objects. Well, I just uh, contacted some some uh, metal people and found out what material I needed to work with in order to gain a sense of stability uh, for the long shafted, small diameter shafted tools. Um, without them fracturing. And a cast, a cast steel, for instance, uh, can, can fracture and break, whereas a softer material, either uh, extruded, probably extruded, could break, but it generally would bend. And I didn't want that either. So I had to work with what's commonly called O1 drill rod for the shafts of the tools. The tool tips themselves are simply um, Ten percent cobalt high-speed steel uh, metal lathe cutting tips. Okay, thank you. And either one of you or both can answer this. Uh, did you study long past woodworkers or furniture makers? How might they have influenced your work? Go ahead, Michael. I'll speak for David and say no. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, I, I looked at a lot of furniture. Um, I won't say that I, I studied them. When we were in college, we part of our um, last load was to um, take a, a course in American, the history of American furniture. But, um, I would okay. study to learn what I needed to know to make what I wanted to make but it wasn't a determined effort to learn about the work of somebody in particular. I'm sorry, I still can't find my face on the screen. Is any, am I showing up on other people? Yes, you are. Yes, okay. you are. 
I, I was hoping I didn't iron a shirt for nothing. <laughs> okay. You look great. Uh, uh, this is for both, answer both of you to answer, is, is if you'd like. Um, my answer to the question is the same. Oh, go ahead. I didn't, I didn't get my inspirations from other wood turners. Uh, I got it from potters and from painters and sculptors uh, whom I had worked with in graduate school and earlier. And then, of course, from Native American ceramics. Okay. Michael, uh, the theme of the craft show at which you'll be honored is future focus. What do you see as a direction for the studio furniture movement? Are there any up and coming artists you especially admire? What do you see coming forward? Boy, I, I don't know. And I'll, to tell you the truth, I don't get out much. <laughs> okay. The, uh, I love the work of um, Pleissnig, makes these beautiful, um, like sand dune like shapes out of fine ribs of wood. Matthias Pleissnig. I don't think we can call him young anymore. Um, they're, you know, my former assistants, Zach DeLuca and uh, Emily Bunker, they're all making beautiful work. I don't know what the work is going to, I don't know how they're going to stay in business 20 years from now or 30 years from now. Um, so I know a lot of people, there, there seems to be a trend for, um, for people to sub out as much of the work as they can. And of course, to use digital technology to make a, a component quickly. I heard a rumor that David was having his pieces made offshore to his specifications, but it has, it has yet to be proven. Oh, yeah. uh, Is there any truth to that rumor? Nope. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's hard, it's hard for me to imagine. I'm, you know, I, I think of, of craftsmen as, as sort of um, the recessive gene of our society. And, um, you know, if, if it follows the trajectory that it is, it doesn't bode well for the future. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, there's always interest in finely made things and um, personal things that have a, a human element. I don't think that will ever die out, um, but commercially it's probably harder to maintain a viable business as we move forward on this trajectory. Right. Questions Let's, for both of you. Um, so many artists are selling their work online now. Uh, do you see a craft show such as ours serving a purpose for future artists? David? Um, I do. It's, it's difficult, particularly with the COVID, as it has evolved over the last two years, almost two years, that when we try and project the future of a marketplace, it is the makers like myself and Michael are so left out of the picture uh, only because society seems to be uh, tending towards politics more than any, any anything else of importance. And, and I think that the passion that's involved in making uh, is such a, a crucial thing to, 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 to preserve within our society, but it's got to start in the, in the grade schools and work its way up like everything else. What I, I think that it's, if it's market driven, it's, it's driving in the wrong direction. And I think in looking at the young turners coming up today in terms of age wise, but also in recognition, there's some fabulous work going on right now. The difficulty that people have is exposing it because there are not that many galleries that can handle that type of work or that would handle it on a regular basis and, uh, and continue to sell it. Um, that end market of, the, of the, the acquisition or the buyer, the collector. Right. So on that note, where would be a, a place you might recommend museums, Sorry. shows, galleries to see this? Woodworking, wood turning today. You mentioned well, places. Yeah, uh, Momentum Gallery in Asheville, North Carolina is my only source right at the moment. They handle all of my work and it's a fabulous gallery, but it's, there's only one other wood turner in there and two or three uh, woodworkers, but the surrounding artists complement all of that uh, work in painting and sculpture. So it's, it's a multimedia gallery. 
with about 80 different artists in it. And one of the most beautiful galleries I've ever seen uh, in, in my time. But um, the, the classic uh, wood turning gallery like Del Mono used to be in California, it basically doesn't exist with any authority today. We've got, that's why so many young people are going to the internet to market their work because they can't get out. If they get to a craft show and they cancel a craft show because of the COVID, it wipes out half of their, their annual income right there or could. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have to be more careful, I think, about selecting uh, and, and individually target our directions uh, as best we can. Bye. Thank you both. And See you in spring. Thank you.